The Rat Catcher, by Roald Dahl. In the afternoon, the Rat Catcher came to the filling station. He came sidling up the driveway with a stealthy, soft-treading gait, making no noise at all with his feet on the gravel. He had an army knapsack slung over one shoulder, and he was wearing an old-fashioned black jacket with large pockets. His brown corduroy trousers were tied around the knees with pieces of white string. Yes, Claude asked, knowing very well who he was. Rodan operative. His small dark eyes moved swiftly over the premises. The rat catcher. That's me. The man was lean and brown, with a sharp face and two long sulphur-coloured teeth that protruded from the upper jaw, overlapping the lower lip, pressing it inward. The ears were thin and pointed, and set far back on the head, nearing the nape of the neck. The eyes were almost black, but when they looked at you, there was a flash of yellow somewhere inside them. You've come very quick. Special orders from the elf officer. And now you're going to catch all the rats? Yep. The kind of dark, furtive eyes he had were those of an animal that lives its life peering out cautiously and forever from a hole in the ground. How are you going to catch them? Ah, the rat man said darkly. That's all according to where they is. Trap em, I suppose. Trap em? he cried, disgusted. You won't catch many rats that way. Rats isn't rabbits, you know. He held his face up high, sniffing the air with a nose that twitched perceptibly from side to side. No, he said scornfully. Trapping's no way to catch a rat. Rats is clever. Let me tell you that. If you want to catch em, you got to know em. You got to know rats on this job. I could see Claude staring at him with a certain fascination. They're more clever than dogs, rats is. Get away. You know what they do. They watch you. All the time you're going round preparing to catch em. They're sitting quietly in dark places watching you. The man crouched, stretching his stringy neck far forward. So what do you do? Claude asked, fascinated. Ah, that's it, you see. That's where you got to know rats. How do you catch them? There's ways, the rat man said, leering. There's various ways. He paused, nodding his repulsive head sagely up and down. It's all depending, he said, on where they is. This ain't a sewer job, is it? No, it's not a sewer job. Tricky thing, sewer jobs, yes he said, delicately sniffing the air to the left of him with his mobile nose end. Sewer jobs is very tricky things. Not especially, I shouldn't think. Oh no, you shouldn't, shouldn't you? Well, I'd like to see you do a sewer job. Just exactly how would you set about it, I'd like to know. Nothing to it. I'd just poison them, that's all. And where exactly would you put the poison, might I ask? Down the sewer. Where the hell you think I'd put it? There. The rat man cried triumphant. I knew it, down the sewer. And you know what would happen then? Get washed away, that's all. Sewer's like a river, you know. That's what you say, Claude answered. That's only what you say. It's facts. All right then, all right. So what would you do, Mr. Noel? That's exactly where you got to know rats on a sewer job. Come on then, let's have it. Now listen, I'll tell you. The rat man advanced a step closer. His voice became secretive and confidential, the voice of a man divulging fabulous professional secrets. You works on the understanding that a rat is a gnawing animal, see? Rats gnaws. Anything you give them, don't matter what it is, anything they never seen before. And what do they do? They gnaws it. So now, there you are, you got a sewer job on your hands, and what do you do? His voice had the soft, throaty sound of a croaking frog, and he seemed to speak all his words with an immense wet-lipped relish, as though they lasted good on the tongue. The accent was similar to Claude's, the broad, soft accent of the Buckinghamshire countryside, but his voice was more throaty, the words more fruity in his mouth. All you do is you go down the sewer, and you take along some ordinary paper bags, just ordinary brown paper bags, and these bags is filled with plaster of Paris powder, nothing else. Then you suspend the bags from the roof of the sewer, so they hang down, not quite touching the water, see? Not quite touching, and just high enough so the rat can reach them. Claude was listening, rapt. There you are, you see? Old rat comes swimming along the sewer, sees the bag, and stops. He takes a sniff air, and it don't smell so bad anyway. So what's he do then? He gnaws it, Claude cried, delighted. There, that's it, that's exactly it. He starts gnawing away at the bag, and the bag breaks, and the old rat gets a mouthful of powder for his pains. Well, that does him. What, 
Kills him? Yep, kills him stony. Plaster of Paris ain't poisonous, you know. Ah, there you are. That's exactly where you're wrong, see? This powder swells. When you wet it, it swells. It gets into the rat's tubes and swells right up and kills him quicker than anything in the world. No, that's where you got to know rats. The rat man's face glowed with a stealthy pride and he rubbed his stringy fingers together, holding the hands up close to the face. Claude watched him, fascinated. Now, where's them rats? The word rats came out of his mouth, soft and throaty, with a rich, fruity relish as though he were gargling with melted butter. Let's take a look at them rats. Over there in the hay brick across the road. Not in the house, he asked, obviously disappointed. No, only around the hay rick, nowhere else. I'll wager they're in the house too, like as not getting in all your food in the night and spreading disease and sickness. You got any disease here? he asked, looking first at me, then at Claude. Everyone fine here. Quite sure. Oh, yes. You never know, you see. You could be sickening for weeks and weeks and not feel it. Then all of a sudden, bang, and it's got you. That's why Dr. Arbuthnot so particular. That's why he sent me out so quick, see, to stop the spreading of disease. He had now taken upon himself the mantle of the health officer. A most important rat he was now, deeply disappointed that we were not suffering from bubonic plague. I feel fine. Claude said nervously. The rat man searched his face again, but said nothing. And how are you going to catch him in the hayrick? The rat man grinned a crafty, toothy grin. He reached down into his knapsack and withdrew a large tin which he held up level with his face. He peered round one side of it at Claude. Pison, he whispered, but he pronounced it pison, making it into a soft, dark, dangerous word. Deadly pison, that's what this is. He was weighing the tin up and down in his hands as he spoke. Enough here to kill a million men. Terrifying, Claude said. Exactly it. They'd put you inside for six months if they caught you with even a spoonful of this, he said, wetting his lips with his tongue. He had a habit of craning his head forward on his neck as he spoke. Want to see? he asked, taking a penny from his pocket, prizing open the lid. There now, there it is. He spoke fondly, almost lovingly of the stuff, and he held it forward for Claude to look. Corn or barley, is it? It's oats, soaked in deadly pison. You take just one of them grains in your mouth and you'll be a goner in five minutes. Honest? Yep, never out me sight this tin. He caressed it with his hands and gave it a little shake, so that the oat grains rustled softly inside. But not today. Your rats don't get this today. They wouldn't have it anyway. That they wouldn't. There's where you got to know rats. Rats is suspicious. Terrible suspicious rats is. So today they'll get some nice clean tasty oats as'll do em no harm in the world. Fatten em. That's all it'll do. And tomorrow they gets the same again. And it'll taste so good. There'll be all the rats in the district coming along after a couple of days. Rather clever. You gotta be clever on this job. You gotta be cleverer than a rat. And that's saying something. You've almost got to be a rat yourself, I said. It slipped out in error before I had time to stop myself. And I couldn't really help it because I was looking at the man at the time. But the effect upon him was surprising. There, he cried. Now you got it. You really said something. A good rat has got to be more like a rat than anything else in the world. Cleverer even than a rat. And that's not an easy thing to be, let me tell you. Quite sure it's not. All right then, let's go. I haven't got all day, you know. There's Lady Leonora Benson asking for me urgent up there at the manor. She got rats too? Everybody's got rats, the rat man said, and he ambled off down the driveway across the road to the hayrick, and we watched him go. The way he walked was so like a rat it made you wonder, that slow, almost delicate ambling walk, with a lot of give at the knees and no sound at all from the footsteps on the gravel. He hopped nimbly over the gate, into the field, then walked quickly round the hayrick, scattering handfuls of oats onto the ground. The next day he returned and repeated the procedure. The day after that he came again, and this time he put down the poisoned oats. But he didn't scatter these, he placed them carefully in little piles at each corner of the rick. You got a dog? he asked when he came back across the road on the third day after putting down the poison. Yes. Now. If you want to see your dog die an horrible, twisting death, all you got to do is let him in that gate sometime. We'll take care, Claude told him. Don't you worry about that. The next day he returned once more, this time to collect the dead. 
You got an old sack? He asked. Most likely we're going to need a sack to put them in. He was puffed up and important now, the black eyes gleaming with pride. He was about to display the sensational results of his craft to the audience. Claude fetched a sack, and the three of us walked across the road, the rat man leading. Claude and I leaned over the gate, watching. The rat man prowled around the hayrick, bending over to inspect his little piles of poison. Something wrong here, he muttered. His voice was soft and angry. He ambled over to another pile and got down on his knees to examine it closely. Something bloody wrong here. What's the matter? Hi guys, I hope you're enjoying the audio ebook. I won't keep you for long. Last year I was demonetized by YouTube and so I lost all opportunity to earn. But I love sharing the audio ebooks with you so much, I carried on. If you value what I'm doing here, please consider heading over to my other channel, Book Club, and hitting that subscribe button as a sign of support. The link's in the description. Now, back to the book. Enjoy. He didn't answer, but it was clear that the rats hadn't touched his bait. These are very clever rats here, I said. Exactly what I told him, Gordon. These aren't just no ordinary kind of rats you're dealing with here. The rat man walked over to the gate. He was very annoyed and showed it on his face and around the nose and by the way the two yellow teeth were pressing down into the skin of his lower lip. Don't give me that crap, he said looking at me. There's nothing wrong with these rats except somebody's feeding them. They got something juicy to eat somewhere and plenty of it. There's no rats in the world who turn down oats unless their bellies is full to bursting. They're clever, Claude said. The man turned away, disgusted. He knelt down again and began to scoop up the poison oats with a small shovel, tipping them carefully back into the tin. When he had done, all three of us walked back across the road. The rat man stood near the petrol pumps, a rather sorry, humble rat man now, whose face was beginning to take on a brooding aspect. He had withdrawn into himself and was brooding in silence over his failure, the eyes veiled and wicked, the little tongue darting out to one side of the two yellow teeth, keeping the lips moist. It appeared to be essential that the lips should be kept moist. He looked up at me, a quick surreptitious glance, then over at Claude. His nose end twitched, sniffing the air. He raised himself up and down a few times on his toes, swaying gently, and in a voice soft and secretive he said, Want to see something? He was obviously trying to retrieve his reputation. What? Want to see something amazing? As he said this, he put his right hand into the deep poacher's pocket of his jacket and brought out a large live rat clasped tight between his fingers. Good God! Ah, that's it, you see? He was crouching slightly now and craning his neck forward and leering at us and holding this enormous brown rat in his hands, one finger and thumb making a tight circle around the creature's neck, clamping its head rigid so it couldn't turn and bite. Do you usually carry rats around in your pockets? Always got a rat or two about me somewhere. With that he put his free hand into the other pocket and produced a small white ferret. Ferret, he said, holding it up by the neck. The ferret seemed to know him and stayed still in his grasp. There's nothing will kill a rat quicker than a ferret, and there's nothing a rat's more frightened of either. He brought his hands close together in front of him, so that the ferret's nose was within six inches of the rat's face. The pink, beady eyes of the ferret stared at the rat. The rat struggled, trying to edge away from the killer. Now, he said, watch. His khaki shirt was open at the neck, and he lifted the rat and slipped it down inside his shirt, next to his skin. As soon as his hand was free, he unbuttoned his jacket at the front, so that the audience could see the bulge the body of the rat made under his shirt. His belt prevented it from going down lower than his waist. Then he slipped the ferret in, after the rat. Immediately there was a great commotion inside the shirt. It appeared that the rat was running around the man's body, being chased by the ferret. Six or seven times they went around, the small bulge chasing the larger one, gaining on it slightly each circuit, and drawing closer and closer, until at last the two bulges seemed to come together, and there was a scuffle and a series of shrill shrieks. Throughout this performance, the rat man had stood absolutely still, with legs apart, arms hanging loosely, the dark eyes resting on Claude's face. Now he reached one hand down into his shirt and pulled out the ferret. With the other, he took out the dead rat. There were traces of blood round the white muzzle of the ferret. Not sure I like that very much. You've never seen anything like it before, I'll bet you that. Can't really say I have. 
Like as not, you'll get yourself a nasty nip in the guts one of these days, Claude told him, but he was clearly impressed and the rat man was becoming cocky again. Want to see something far more amazing than that? he asked. You want to see something you'd never even believe unless you'd seen it with your own eyes? Well, we were standing in the driveway out in front of the pumps and it was one of those pleasant warm November mornings. Two cars pulled in for petrol, one right after the other, and Claude went over and gave them what they wanted. You want to see? the rat man asked. I glanced at Claude, slightly apprehensive. Yes, Claude said. Come on then, let's see. The rat man slipped the dead rat back into one pocket, the ferret into the other. Then he reached down into his knapsack and produced, if you please, a second live rat. Good Christ, Claude said. Always got one or two rats about me somewhere, the man announced calmly. You gotta know rats on this job, and if you want to know em, you gotta have em round you. This is a sewer rat, this is. An old sewer rat, clever as buggery. See him watching me all the time, wondering what I'm going to do. See him. Very unpleasant. What are you going to do, I asked. I had a feeling I was going to like this one even less than the last. Fetch me a piece of string. Claude fetched him a piece of string. With his left hand, the man looped the string around one of the rat's hind legs. The rat struggled, trying to turn its head to see what was going on, but he held it tight around the neck with finger and thumb. Now, he said, looking about him, you got a table inside? We don't want the rat inside the house, I said. Well, I need a table or something flat like a table. What about the bonnet of that car, Claude said. We walked over to the car and the man put the old sewer rat on the bonnet. He attached the string to the windscreen wiper so that the rat was now tethered. At first it crouched, unmoving and suspicious, a big-bodied grey rat with bright black eyes and a scaly tail that lay in a long curl upon the car's bonnet. It was looking away from the rat man, but watching him sideways to see what he was going to do. The man stepped back a few paces and immediately the rat relaxed. It sat up on its haunches and began to lick the grey fur on its chest. Then it scratched its muzzle with both front paws. It seemed quite unconcerned about the three men standing nearby. Now, how about a little bet? the rat man asked. We don't bet, I said. Just for fun. It's more fun if you bet. What do you want to bet on? I'll bet you I can kill that rat without using my hands. I'll put my hands in my pockets and not use them. You'll kick it with your feet, Claude said. It was apparent that the rat man was out to earn some money. I looked at the rat that was going to be killed and began to feel slightly sick, not so much because it was going to be killed, but because it was going to be killed in a special way, with a considerable degree of relish. No, the rat man said, no feet, nor arms, Claude asked, nor arms, nor legs, nor hands either. You'll sit on it. No, no squashing. Let's see you do it. You bet me first. Bet me a quid. Don't be so bloody daft, Claude said. Why should we give you a quid? What will you bet? Nothing. All right then, then it's no go. He made as if to untie the string from the windshield wiper. I'll bet you a shilling, Claude told him. The sick, gastric sensation in my stomach was increasing, but there was an awful magnetism about this business, and I found myself quite unable to walk away or even move. You too? No, I said. What's the matter with you? The rat man asked. I just don't want to bet you, that's all. So you want me to do this for a lousy shilling? I don't want you to do it. Where's the money? He said to Claude. Claude put a shilling piece on the bonnet near the radiator. The rat man produced two sixpences and laid them beside Claude's money. As he stretched out his hand to do this, the rat cringed, drawing its head back and flattening itself against the bonnet. Bet's on the rat man said. Claude and I stepped back a few paces. The rat man stepped forward. He put his hands in his pockets and inclined his body from the waist so that his face was on the level with the rat, about three feet away. His eyes caught the eyes of the rat and held them. The rat was crouching, very tense, sensing extreme danger, but not yet frightened. The way it crouched, it seemed to me, it was preparing to spring forward at the man's face. But there must have been some power in the rat man's eyes that prevented it from doing this, and subdued it, and then gradually frightened it so that it began to back away, dragging its body backward with a slow, crouching steps, until the string tautened on its hind leg. It tried to struggle back further against the string, jerking its leg to free it. The man leaned forward towards the rat, following it with his face, watching it all the time with his eyes, and suddenly the rat panicked and leaped sideways in the air. 
the string pulled it up with a jerk that must almost have dislocated its leg. It crouched again in the middle of the bonnet, as far away as the string would allow, and it was properly frightened now, whiskers quivering, the long grey body tense with fear. At this point the rat man again began to move his face closer. Very slowly he did it, so slowly there wasn't really any movement to be seen at all, except that the face just happened to be a fraction closer each time you looked. He never took his eyes from the rat. The tension was considerable, and I wanted suddenly to cry out and tell him to stop. I wanted him to stop because it was making me feel sick inside, but I couldn't bring myself to say the word. Something extremely unpleasant was about to happen, I was sure of that. Something sinister and cruel and rat-like, and perhaps it really would make me sick, but I had to see it now. The rat man's face was about eighteen inches from the rat. Twelve inches, then ten, or perhaps it was eight, and soon there was not more than the length of a man's hand separating their faces. The rat was pressing its body flat against the car bonnet, tense and terrified. The rat man was also tense, but with a dangerous active tensity that was like a tight wound spring. The shadow of a smile flickered around the skin of his mouth. Then suddenly he struck. He struck as a snake strikes, darting his head forward with one swift, knife-like stroke that originated in the muscles of the lower body, and I had a momentary glimpse of his mouth opening very wide and two yellow teeth and the whole face contorted by the effort of mouth opening. More than that I did not care to see. I closed my eyes, and when I opened them again the rat was dead, and the rat man was slipping the money into his pocket and spitting to clear his mouth. That's what they makes licorice out of he said. Rat's blood is what the big factories and the chocolate people used to make licorice. Again the relish, the wet lip, lip-smacking relish as he spoke the words, the throaty richness of his voice, and the thick syrupy way he pronounced the word licorice. No, he said, there's nothing wrong with a drop of rat's blood. Don't talk so absolutely disgusting, Claude told him. Ah, but that's it, you see. You eaten it many a time. Penny sticks and licorice boot laces is all made from rat's blood. We don't want to hear about it, thank you. Boiled up it is, in great cauldrons, bubbling and steaming and men stirring it with long poles. That's one of the big secrets of the chocolate-making factories, and no one knows about it. No one except the ratters supplying the stuff. Suddenly he noticed that his audience was no longer with him, that our faces were hostile and sick-looking and crimson with anger and disgust. He stopped abruptly, and without another word he turned and sloped off down the driveway out onto the road, moving with the slow, that almost delicate ambling walk that was like a rat prowling, making no noise with his footsteps, even on the gravel of the driveway. The End if you value what I'm doing here, please consider heading over to my other channel, Book Club, and hitting that subscribe button as a sign of support. The link's in the description.